Hello, thank you very much. My name's Tom Macy Dare. Uh, I'm a barrister at Quadrant Chambers. I specialise in commercial law, and I've got particular expertise in interim remedies, jurisdictional disputes, and applications for urgent relief. And today I'm going to be talking to you about one of the most useful and important tools in any litigator's armoury. That's the anti-suit injunction and how to get one. What is an anti-suit injunction? It's a court order restraining a person, the respondent, from commencing or pursuing legal proceedings in a foreign court. And you can also get mandatory versions which require a respondent to take a positive step like discontinuing foreign court proceedings. You'll note from those formulations that an anti-suit injunction is an order addressed to a person, the respondent. It's not addressed to the foreign court, and that's important because it's meant to reflect a principle of international law known as comity, which basically means that the courts of one country should not interfere unduly with what happens in another country. So the idea is that the English court isn't telling the foreign court what to do, it's telling the respondent what to do and what not to do in the foreign court. And that is supposed to be OK. But that's not how the foreign courts see it, especially the ones which don't follow the English common law tradition. And in particular, Europe has a big problem with anti-suit injunctions. In fact, European law prohibits courts from granting anti-suit injunctions in relation to legal proceedings in the EU and in EFTA member states. The UK's left the EU, so EU law doesn't apply. But as I speak, UK is currently trying to join the 2007 Lugano Convention, which would have the same effect. So it's really important that you check the position before you apply for an anti-suit injunction in relation to proceedings in Europe. I'm going to focus on four questions. Number one, when might you want an anti-suit injunction? Number two, on what grounds can you get one? Number three, how do you go about applying for one? And number four, what are the important points to consider when you apply? So firstly, when might you want an anti-suit injunction? Well, broadly, there are two situations. First situation, you're bringing proceedings in England and someone commences proceedings in a foreign court aimed at undermining or outflanking your English proceedings. And the classic example of that is known as the Italian torpedo manoeuvre. That, that's uh, where you're just about to commence proceedings in England. Maybe you're claiming damages for breach of contract. And the defendant gets wind of this and commences proceedings against you in Italy, which is famously a place where proceedings happen very slowly. And so because the proceedings started there first, under EU law, the English proceedings would have to be stayed. So that's one example. The other main situation is where you're not bringing proceedings anywhere. In fact, you may have no intention of doing so, but someone commences proceedings against you in a foreign court, and you consider that they should only be permitted to do so in England. And that's usually, but not always, because of an English jurisdiction or arbitration clause. On what grounds can you get an anti-suit injunction? Well, in principle, they're available whenever the ends of justice require it, but that's a pretty unhelpful test. In practice, there are two categories to consider, contractual cases and non-contractual cases. Let's look at contractual cases first. That's where the foreign proceedings are being brought in breach of contract. So in breach of an exclusive English jurisdiction agreement or of an arbitration agreement. And those sorts of agreements are said to contain a negative covenant. So that's a promise not to bring proceedings anywhere other than the chosen forum. That's why we refer to exclusive jurisdiction agreements. Non-exclusive jurisdiction clauses don't have that negative covenant. So it's not a breach of contract to bring proceedings in a different court. Now, contractual cases are usually quite straightforward. Generally, there are no issues over jurisdiction, no major concerns over comity. Then we have non-contractual cases, and these are less straightforward. There's a two-part test. Lim one, generally, you have to demonstrate that the English court has jurisdiction to hear the underlying dispute, 
and that it's the appropriate forum, the forum convenience, and you'll all be familiar with the Spilliarder test for that. If you satisfy Lim 1, that gives the English court a sufficient interest in the matter to justify thinking about granting an injunction, but that's not enough on its own. That's because of comity. You need something more to justify the English court actually granting an injunction. So that brings us to Lim 2. Either the foreign proceedings must be vexatious, oppressive or unconscionable, or, and there's a catch-all, the ends of justice must otherwise require that an injunction be granted. Those are a bit vague. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. Classic case of vexatious foreign proceedings is where the claim in the foreign proceedings is obviously hopeless. So a couple of years ago I did a case involving a collision between two ships. Ship A sitting at anchor, minding its own business in the correct place. Ship B steams in and crashes into the side of ship A. A pretty clear case. But the owners of ship B, the bad guys, sued the owners of ship A in a foreign court for tactical reasons, claiming damages. Obviously a hopeless case. An example of where the ends of justice otherwise require an injunction, that's the catch-all, is where, for example, the foreign proceedings are in conflict with some overriding principle of English public policy. So how do you apply for an anti-suit injunction? The procedure will depend upon whether or not you've got substantive proceedings in England and on how urgently you need your injunction. If you've commenced substantive proceedings in England against a respondent, or if you're about to commence them, then you can simply apply for an injunction in those proceedings by issuing an application notice with evidence in a witness statement and a draft order. That's CPR part 23. If you don't have substantive proceedings in England, then you're going to need to commence fresh proceedings here just for the purposes of an anti-suit injunction by issuing a part eight claim form, again, with a witness statement and a draft order. Usual place for doing that is the commercial court. You'll need to think about jurisdiction if you issue a part eight claim. If you need to serve your claim form out of the jurisdiction on the respondent, then you will need to consider whether you are bringing your claim on a contractual or a non-contractual basis. If it's a contractual basis, then you can serve out, you may need permission. In a non-contractual case, you can't. Now, whether you're applying for an anti-suit injunction in your existing substantive proceedings or in part eight proceedings, if you need it urgently, you can always apply on short notice in those proceedings for an interim anti-suit injunction. I say short notice, rarely if ever appropriate to apply entirely without notice. And the procedure for that is CPR part 23, application notice with a witness statement and a draft order. If your case is really urgent, you can even apply for an interim injunction before you commence proceedings. If the court grants an interim injunction on short notice, Initially, that injunction will only last for a short period, maybe a week or two, just to give the respondent a chance to prepare evidence and submissions in response. The court will set a return date when both parties can attend court for a fuller punch-up. And if you're following the Part 8 procedure, the court may treat that return date as the final hearing in the entire proceedings. Finally, a couple of important points to consider when applying and these reflect the discretionary nature of the remedy. Point one, don't delay making your application. If you do, the court may refuse it, particularly if the respondent has incurred costs progressing the foreign proceedings during the delay. And uh, point two, avoid taking any step in the foreign proceedings beyond simply challenging the jurisdiction of the foreign court unless you absolutely have no choice about it. Again, if you do, the court is likely to refuse your injunction. That's a good place to stop, so thank you very much indeed.